Hey everyone, so today we'll be talking about the paper titled Dutch Disease or Agglomeration, the Local Economic Effects of Natural Resource Booms in Modern America. So first, we'll go over some terms and then get a little background, and then we'll dive into the research question, the methodology, the findings, and then finally, the conclusions of the paper. So Dutch disease is a concept that describes an economic phenomenon where rapid development of one sector in the economy creates a decline in other sectors. Um, and, you know, this is related to the natural resource curse, which says that countries with oil, uh, minerals, other natural resources have on average failed to show better economic performances than those without. Um, agglomeration means a phenomenon of firms being located close to each other for uh, pur purposes of efficiency. And the learning by doing uh, effect is a phenomenon of productivity growth associated with more experience um, by firms you know, manufacturing, especially over time. Um, the relative effect is the ratio of, you know, outcomes measured in one treatment comparison group compared to another. And the absolute effect is a difference in the outcome between treatment comparison groups in the study. And so, you know, literature has uh, long debated whether natural resource abundance is good or not for economic growth. And one argument is that, you know, yes, it is. Um, Obviously, consumers benefit from increased profits from natural resources that they can gain from extracting those resources. But argument two is that no, because there is a natural resource curse. And, you know, as there is more resources to be extracted, it crowds out the manufacturing because less capital is focused towards that, which reduces, you know, productivity and reduces long term growth and welfare. And so this paper combines, you know, county level data on employment population with county level data on oil and gas production and reserves, along with, you know, data on uh, manufacturing to really see if the relationship holds. So the research question proposes, you know, has oil and gas extraction benefited people who live in resource abundant areas? And specifically, what have been the local economic impacts of oil and gas booms and busts? within the U.S. over the past half century. And some background on U.S. oil and gas booms. Um, so prices rose in 1970s due to, you know, a couple of conflicts, including the uh, Arab oil embargo, Iranian revolution, Iran-Iraq war, and then prices decreased right after that due to a recession and, you know, the U.S. Uh, supply response to the high prices in the 1970s that really boosted supply. But then, in the early 2000s, there was another boom in prices um, as, you know, there's more global demand growth. And so employment in the sector really reflects and follows the prices of oil. So oil prices are high, employment tends to be high um, as well. And if oil prices fall, then employment tends to also fall in the sector. Um, and another thing to note is that, you know, in the late 1990s, uh, a new way uh, of attracting oil uh, called fracking, um, extracting oil in impermeable rocks that, you know, are considered unconventional oil, um, became more commercially, commercially viable, allowing the U.S. to unlock a lot more oil. And so, you know, the model was set up with two counties, A and B, with imperfectly mobile population, and it assumed that there are three production sectors, M, L, and R, M equals tradable goods, L is local, non-tradable good are as natural resources. Uh, and every sector has revenue productivity and assumes that county B does not have natural resources. And so there are also three time periods in the model. So a time period zero, both country, counties are symmetric, so both don't have natural resources. At count, time period one, a county experiences a temporary resource boom while the other doesn't. Um, and at, time, at T equals two, the boom ends. So, you know, both counties go back to being as zero resources and resource product to be exogenous. And um, um, yeah, this is just the uh, function for the firm. Um, so, you know, the function, the revenue function for the firm is a function of the product between revenue productivity and the workers. Um, and if you do some algebra, you can, you know, find equations that solve um, profit maximization and and uh, the total labor demand for the county. And 
you know, revenue productivity, they assumed is price times physical productivity. Um, and um, physical productivity sector in the sector evolve over time subject to two productivity spillovers. Um, and the first productivity spillover is, as mentioned before, learning by doing, where, you know, the sector's current productivity increases um, due to, you know, the sector's past employment. So getting more productive due to experience. Um, and the second one is agglomeration spillovers. So, you know, current productivity increases with past local population and you know, the local concentration of these industries. Uh, and um, the physical productivity um, in the sector can be modeled with uh, the following equation. And so, um, yeah, this is just the final uh, equation in the production model. So on the consumer side for the model, um, the individual eye consumers consume uh, local goods, housing, and tradable goods. Uh, and this is the utility that they receive, which is a function between the country's amenity and the uh, idiosyncratic taste um, for their, their county. county. Um, and the local resource boom is assumed to not affect A, which is the county's amenity. And uh, this is the utility function that the individuals maximize subject to this constraint. Um, and the labor supply, inverse labor supply difference between the two countries is uh, mapped out with the following equation. And the social welfare equation um, is assumed to be the uh, indirect utility of people who live in county in the county in all periods. And it is mapped out with uh, this equation um, and it assumes also a discount factor. Uh, and for, you know, the relative and absolute effects, the relative effects is that, you know, does the rel resource boom increase cumulative social welfare in county A relative to uh, county B? Um, and that is captured with this equation. And the paper also considers absolute effects where, you know, it asks, does the resource boom increase cumulative social welfare in county A relative to the counterfactual um, and that is captured with this equation. The setup of the economic model allows us to generate some predictions. Prediction one states that a resource boom increases population and wages in time period one. This is important because the entire Dutch disease mechanism begins with an initial wage increase during the resource boom. Prediction two states that a resource boom increases local sector employment and prices and decreases tradable sector employment in time period one. Prediction two highlights that the effect of a resource boom on overall manufacturing employment depends on the share of manufacturers that are traded versus sold locally. If a large proportion is traded, then it will be crowded out during a resource boom. Remember earlier, we defined Dutch disease as an appreciation in our home currency. Therefore, their manufactured goods are more expensive to buy on a global market. Therefore, they lost competitive advantage and got crowded out. On the contrary, if the majority of manufacturing is sold locally, it will be crowded in. Prediction three says that if and only if there are agglomeration spillovers or local sector learning by doing spillovers, a resource boom today increases local sector productivity tomorrow. Prediction four says that a resource boom increases welfare if and only if this equation here holds. The equation shows us that the relative welfare is more likely to increase under several conditions. First, if social planner is less patient, meaning delta is small, then growth during the boom in period one can outweigh losses in period two. Second, if agglomeration spillover lambda is large, then county A benefits more from population increase during the boom. Third, if local sector learning by doing theta one is strong, or the local good expenditure share alpha is large, then county A benefit more from an increase in local sector learning by doing in period two. Fourth, if tradable sector learning by doing theta M is weak, the sector's contraction in period one has smaller negative consequences in period two. Fifth, if housing supply is more elastic, which means K is lower, the housing expenditure share beta is lower, 
locational preferences are weaker, hence S is smaller in equation, or production is less uh, labor intensive, gamma is larger, then the tradable sector contracts less in period one. Prediction three and four allows us to compare the cases with and without the productivity spillovers. If there are none, um, then the two counties have equal productivity, population, and wage after period one, and a resource boom unambiguously increases relative welfare. If there are spillovers, then local sector welfare will increase. How much will depend on the strength of learning by doing versus agglomeration. Also notice that prediction one and two almost happened immediately after the resource boom. Wage, prices, they respond pretty quickly, but productivity and welfare, they don't just change overnight. Therefore, prediction three and four are targeting the long-term effect of a resource boom. With these predictions, it completes a Dutch disease chain of events. Increase in resource sector revenue productivity increases local wages, as we predicted in prediction one. Then it leads to a decrease in tradable sector employment, as in prediction two. Then leads to a decrease in tradable sector productivity, as in prediction three then ultimately it could cause a decrease in cumulative welfare as per prediction four. Now that we have prediction to test using real data, this section will explain what data sources did the authors use and what variables did they observe for testing the predictions. For resource data, the authors proxied the measure of each county's oil and gas revenue productivity with the density of economically recoverable oil and gas that was in the ground before the analysis. This endowment is to be only determined by geological factors that are exogenous to the economic outcomes. The oil and gas production data are from a new county by year panel data set from 1960s to 2011. And this data set is provided by Drilling Info, a market research company. They also had to reach out to local authorities to collect data that was missing in Drilling Info. Proven reserves data are from Energy Information Administration or EIA, EIA collects proven reserves and production by each firm in each oil field. Undiscovered reserves are estimated by the U.S. Geological Survey on the basis of the expected oil, gas, and natural gas liquid yield using current technology. This table here summarizes the variables they are going to use from the resource data. The primary source of data on employment, earnings, and population is a regional economic information system, or RACE, which has county level data available from 1969 to 2014. The authors used race for national level coal employment and oil and gas employment, as well as county level population, total employment, total earnings, manufacturing employment, and manufacturing earnings. Nationwide historical housing rent data is primarily collected from decennial census and American community survey. Again, the table here summarizes a variable and some descriptive stats. Manufacturing census microdata are collected from the census of manufacturers, manufacturers, CM. This data set includes microdata for all manufacturing plants in the US. The data include the county where the plant is located, its four digit SIC code, as well as number of employees, total wage bill, value of material inputs, and total revenues. The authors believe that the subsets of manufacturers may be affected by resource boom differently. Therefore, they distinguish subsectors along two dimensions, tradability and linkage to oil and gas. Using a measure designed by Holmes and Stevens, they found that 69% of manufacturing industries are tradable in their data sets. For each industry, they calculated the direct oil and gas output share, which is a share of output purchased by the oil and gas sector, and indirect oil and gas output share, which is a share of output purchased by the oil and gas sector, through an immediate industry. They define the upstream linkage share as a sum of these two quantities. They define an industry as upstream if this quantity is larger than 0.1% and downstream if the oil and gas input cost is larger than 0.1%. We refer to an industry as non-linked if it's neither upstream or downstream. Using this classification method, they found that 27% of industries are upstream, 2.5% are downstream, 73% are non-linked and 2.1% are neither. Sorry, 2.1% are both upstream and downstream. To see if the data set um, match with their predictions, the authors used a Rubin causal model to show formally how tall R and tall A 
translate from the two county model to the many county empirical setting. Tall R is a relative effect of resource boom that is comparing counties with high versus low endowments. And tall A is our absolute effect. This measures each county's difference in potential outcomes if it had higher versus lower endowments. This regression here is our specification to estimate the relative effect. Uh, YCT is the outcome of county C in time period T. Tall R is our relative effect on RCT, our natural resources. ET is our oil and gas employment. Y0C is a vector of two baseline values of the outcome from two, two different years uh, at the beginning and end of 1960s. VDT is a vector of census division by year indicator variables. Lambda and mu t are parameters, and epsilon is our error term. We're not going to explain fully the mechanism uh, of these econ econometrics model due to time constraints, but we will show you the findings that are generated through these regressions. Similarly, the authors derive the regression for absolute effect. What's different here from the previous one is that in this regression, the authors added a new component. This part here is the sum of oil and gas endowment for all other counties with centroids within eight different donuts around County C. You can imagine these donuts as rings with uh, incremental radius spreading out from our county. The authors assume that counties outside a maximum radius of 400 miles are unaffected. And with each increment of 50 miles, that gives eight donuts in total. This is also useful when considering the geographic spillover effect later. The author used this regression to estimate how changes in resource booms affect continuing plants. Finally, the authors use a long difference specification to test for pre-1973 trends and measure long-term effects of the boom and bust of the 1970s and 80s. Here, they regressed the long differences on early endowment, controlling for two baseline outcomes, long Y0C, and for census division fixed effect VD. After running the above mentioned regression, here's what they found. They found that endowments are positively and significantly correlated with population and employment, and positively but not significantly correlated with manufacturing employment. This implies that resource abundant counties had grown faster over the decades since they began producing oil and gas. Manufacturing sector correlation depends heavily on the type of manufacturing. A st one standard deviation increase in oil and gas endowment is associated with an 8.9% increase um, in linked manufacturing employment. In contrast, the relationships between endowments and employments in other manufacturing subject, sub subsectors are insignificant. As the resource sector expands, total employment and wages rise immediately. Population adjusts more slowly, however, meaning that the short run effects of a resource boom are to increase wages and decrease unemployment. Within one or two years, people migrate in search of higher wages and this migration moderates weight changes. They found from their data that outcomes in higher endowment counties are statistically significantly more procyclical with national oil and gas employment than in lower endowment counties. In other words, a boom significantly increases relative growth and a bust significantly decreases relative growth. They also found that a one standard deviation increase in natural resources lead to about 2.3% increase in exporters' local cost during the boom from 2007 to 2014. After wages rise, the next step of the Dutch disease mechanism is that the tradable sector is crowded out, per the model's prediction too. But what they found is the opposite. There's no evidence of crowding out. Relative manufacturing employment in resource abundant counties is clearly procyclical with oil and gas booms. In the context of prediction two, manufacturing's procyclic procyclicality with resource booms suggests that a significant share of manufacturing is locally traded, and that growth in locally stranded manufacturing subsectors outweighs any contraction in traded sectors. For the manufacturing sectors overall, revenue productivity is positively associated with oil and gas booms. Effects appear to be stronger for local industries and those linked to the oil and gas sector. In contrast, in non-linked and tradable industries, neither measure of revenue productivity covariates with resource booms, with point estimate close to zero.
Connecting to prediction three, the results show that any effect of resource booms on tradable sector productivity are economically and statistically insignificant. Thus, the key link in the possible Dutch disease chain of events is broken. For long-term effects, the, their results showed that the overall effects are insignificant. In a context of the model, these results also provide insights as to whether resource booms have lasting impacts on amenities, such as environmental quality. The fact that there are no statistically significant long-term effects on productivity, population, or wages, therefore suggests that people perceive equal amenities in resource-abundant counties. Thus, the oil and gas boom and bust of the 1970s and 80s had no detectable negative long-term effects on average amenities. This counters concerns about potential harm from oil and gas extraction using conventional technologies. Finally, the authors present the social welfare uh, effects of oil and gas booms in their sample. From the table, we can see that relative absolute real earning gains are 1.6% and 0.7%. The annual average real earnings gain from one center deviation additional oil and gas endowment is approximately 1% relative uh, to other industries, sorry, to other, to, to other counties during the boom, and approximately 0.4% relative of counties' own counterfactual. These real earnings gains equal social welfare gains only if the resource booms do not affect amenities or environmental quality. However, oil and gas production may affect environmental quality. The final role shows that population averages approximately 0.8% higher in counties with one standard deviation additional endowment over the full 1969 to 2000, 2014 period. Thus, oil and gas endowments have increased relative welfare overall. So in conclusion, um, the oil and gas boom significantly increases wages. Uh, and the overall manufacturing, employment, output, and revenue, productivity are all pro-cyclical with resource booms. So they go up uh, with the resource boom. And, you know, though resource booms crowd out uh, highly tradable manufacturing, the subsectors don't actually experience temporary or permanent reductions to revenue productivity, uh, which means that, you know, welfare in the long run uh, in aggregate does go up. Um, and thank you for listening to our presentation. Thank <music> you.